Hey guys, so obviously we're in the car at the moment on our way to the airport. Bo's at the end of his three week uh, little sojourn over here in Victoria. Where are you heading off to now? Uh, to Canberra. Canberra? Teach yeah. a couple of courses there? Yep. And then I'll make my way to Sydney and then fly out from Sydney back home. Very good. Finally get back to Perth where you go into lockdown for two weeks and then you can get on with your life. Yeah, hopefully. We'll yeah, <laughs> that's, that's been a big month. So we were chatting this morning, right, about um, people's understanding of, or that an industry's perception of how we change the state of tissue with manual therapies, um, and maybe some misconceptions, uh, misrepresentations of what we're doing. Um, and then I think we were specifically talking about how that ties into some of the modalities we use, and, and yeah, I thought we might record this conversation, and uh, it's just, sorry for the background noise, everyone, we're on the road trying to make the most of our time. Um, but record the conversation and let everyone give, give everyone a bit of an insight into maybe a deeper understanding of what's happening when we are applying myofascial work and other manual therapies. Yeah, yeah. so I think the big thing is, you know, myofascial release um, and releasing tissue and mechanically changing the state of tissue. And I think that's a bit of a misconception as to when we apply a, a, a pressure or a shearing force, whatever it may be, to the tissue that we're creating these mechanical changes and I think there's a lot more to it when we consider the effects of the nervous system and, and um, you know when we apply this myofascial release and think about it as a sort of a static sustained um, pressure on the tissue that you know often we don't actually apply enough pressure or do it for long enough to create mechanical deformation of the tissue so there's you know various other mechanisms that we need to consider and not just have this purely mechanical understanding of what we're doing. And I think that defining the mechanical deformation bit is the key, isn't it? Because yeah. we, you can apply a very subtle, very gentle, almost imperceivable kind of um, uh, input to the, to the tissue and the patient and often the therapist will perceive a change. That's They'll get up right, off the table yeah. and go, oh, that feels better. You know, I feel like I can move better, there's less pain. Yeah. And okay, well, there's a number of reasons why that might be the case, right? And it's not necessarily we've pulled the fibres apart or lengthened tissue or realigned collagen or anything like that. Yeah. There's there's the potential for some change structurally, but those subtle, softer, shorter applications are not going to get it done. Yeah, and, you know, we consider the, the various types of connective tissue from loose irregular to, to dense irregular and, and dense regular connective tissue and um, when we look at the the arrangement of the collagen fibers they are very strong very tough tissues and you know if someone is applying a, a static uh, myofascial release technique and they say well, I can feel the tissues melting away and I, so I know that that's working well is the tissue actually melting away or has it created a change input to the, the nervous system that's created more uh, vascular changes, more um, changes in that sensor input, and then a decrease in muscle tone via the autonomic nervous system. Mm. And I think people are getting caught up in the, okay, I'm applying mechanical force and getting a mechanical outcome. You know, that deformation is the mechanical outcome. Not necessarily the case. We're applying sensory input in lots of different ways. Any kind of massage stroke you do is very, it's a, it's a moment in time. Your hand slides across the tissue, your thumb frictions across the tissue. It's a moment in time. Yeah. That provides sen um, somatosensory input to the nervous system. And then your body will do something with that. Yeah. One, one change might be an increase in blood supply, an increase in uh, vascular perfusion. It might be, we, we talk about plasma extravasation, mm. where plasma will move out of the blood vessels, through the blood vessel wall, into the interstitial spaces and hydrates that connective tissue that changes the, the feel of the tissue. Yeah, It's a temporary change though. Exactly, so yeah. when we think of those loose connective tissues, our areola tissue, um, you know, we might be able to affect that, but it is short term. You know, you take away that, that heat and the, the force, um, that will go back to its, its original state. So um, interesting when we start to think about that from a, a pain point of view, you know, we certainly can can modulate someone's pain with these techniques, um, but are we actually lengthening or deforming that tissue? Mm. If we look at the, the different mechanisms at play, we've got uh, a, a pain gate mechanism, yep. we've got an endogenous opioid mechanism, um, what else have we got going on there? Well, the descending pain modulation, which is, plays into that um, uh, 
opioid system. Yeah. Um, We've got that increased vas- vascularization. You know, yep. we can improve the blood flow and nutrients to that localized area. Yep. Um, then all the intangibles of things like you know the expectation that comes with a manual therapy technique. You've had good experiences in the past. Yeah. You expect this one to work, so therefore your brain will find a way to reduce pain for you. There's the um, you know the conducive environment. We've, there's plenty of research to support the fact that if you have an, a calming, um, supportive. Um, conducive environment to re- to uh, reduce pain, stress, and all these, and work nicely with your you know sympathetic nervous system to make it more parasympathetic. Then all of these things kind of combine to give you a perception of change. Yeah, and that's key because you know that brings me to th- thinking about um, if we were purely having this mechanical effect on on the tissue and that alone. Um, well, they've anesthetized. What is that word again? Anesthetized. <laughs> so I always get stumbled up on that. But they've, you know, um, put people under anesthetic and um, applied these same techniques, but have had a different result to when uh, they're in, when they're conscious. So, if it was purely mechanical, we'd expect the same result with with um, in, in both uh, subjects. That's so, right. Yep. Yeah. Interesting to think about it like that when. We've got this uh, sense change in sensory input. We're going to have a different output in the tissues, changes in the, the nervous system. Um, so I think there's multiple factors at play here. Yeah, and so we're, we're not arguing to say that we don't get any structural change. That's not the case. I think a lot of the techniques that we use, in fact, probably the majority of them, don't necessarily produce that structural change in the tissue or ch- you know, change at a... At a um, yeah, I guess a, a tissue level, but there are some techniques that with enough loads and applied in the right direction with enough force over enough time can get some structural change. So we're to, at a cellular and tissue level, we get some reorganization of those tissues and then that will lengthen. It will give you more range of motion and give you freedom of movement, um, but it has to be sufficient to get that change, yeah. right? Yeah, and we, we think of you know other tools we use, for example, cups. We can leave a cup on for a longer period of time. It's a stronger force. It's multi-directional. And we know when we look at the orientation of this uh, dense irregular connective tissue um, that you know it's going to respond best to multi-directional pull. Yep. Um, you know, and then what well, when we do say a, a functional release cupping technique and in, in our phase three where we actually have the patient loaded and moving so that can create a, a stronger more sustained um, change which could potentially have more of a mechanical effect for sure and that, I think for those who haven't learned or um, seen the functional release cupping technique in, in its entirety most of you you've probably seen it online or whatever but the, most of people would be familiar with the movements where the cups are on and the person's up and moving we call that phase three that's like the end of the sequence if you are working through a protocol towards you know a treatment so the early phases, phase one and phase two, are unloaded. The body's not under it. The tissue's under under as much strain. The cup is essentially doing the work, and you might be doing some active or passive, but very low load movements, which is perfect for the pain modulation. It's perfect for changing the tissue at a at a, um, at a chemical level, improving circulation, improving um, vascular or vascularization, and then the plasma to hydrate that tissue. And so that's why we use phase one and two in the early stages when someone's very um, resistant due to pain or restriction yeah. um, they're hesitant um, they are guarded we can use these very subtle gentle um, comfortable techniques to get the person moving and the tissues uh, receptive and then we move into these more higher loads more sustained loads uh, which is your phase three and that makes perfect sense and we were, we were sort of chatting earlier about this and sort of interesting that while we've been doing this FRC technique for well I've been doing it for over a decade now the technique hasn't changed, but my understanding, our understanding of it has definitely changed. Yeah. And that's through information like this. We're, we're finding the science to support what we've always known. And I imagine that's the case with just about every modality everyone that's watching this would use. There's, there's stuff that we know works, and we might have an idea on how it works, but if you just stuck with that one idea, and you just got your blinkers on, um, you, you might not discover all this other breadth and, and depth to it. And we're still now discovering a decade down the track of how this techi- technique actually works. And that gives us the opportunity to be more specific in our yeah. treatments. We and can be more targeted. Definitely. And, 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 you know, that brings us 
brings me to thinking about those receptors, right? Yep. So when we look at creating improved mobility through the tissue, and we've got our Golgi tendon organs, mm -hmm. which don't tend to respond to static stretching. But for the longest time people thought that though, yeah. you could stretch the tendon, that gives you your Golgi tendon organ reflex, but not the case. Yeah, so yeah. They, they respond when the tissue is under load. Yep. All right. Contractile so, load. Yeah. Not stretch load. Yeah. The muscle's got to contract. It has to yeah. pull on the tendon. Yeah. Which is really interesting when you start to think about, well, how do I engage that Golgi, Golgi tendon organ, which can have an inhibitory effect on that muscle to help to allow it to, to lengthen um, and the, the, the fascial components along with that. Mm -hmm. um, so using a, a, uh, a mechanical tool such as, such as a, a cup, um, and then taking that patient through a loaded environment, we can now affect that Golgi tendon organ and mm. get better changes in, in range of motion and, and movement. I think everybody now, or most people would agree that active movement, active engagement of the patient's nervous system in a, in a treatment is always gonna be a far better um, goal than a purely passive treatment. Mm. And I know that so many of us still work purely passively and we get good results, fine, that's no problem at all. But what if, we could take that person from a passive treatment, start to incorporate some loading of tissues, some engagement of, of contractile activity to a more functional um, kind of treatment protocol or treatment plan for the person. What if we did that? Would that mean the difference between the person needing to rely on us for longer? Or would it mean that, okay, we can get them out from underneath that reliance earlier and be self-managing or maybe even not even need any of our kind of um, treatments? Yeah. You know, that's the that active engagement is the bit that manual therapy has missed for the longest time, I think. And that's why, you know, you can, there's two camps. We've yeah. got the anti-manual therapy people and the, and the, um, the pro-manual therapy people. If you just look at manual therapy as a passive exchange, one person giving, one person receiving, there's so many flaws in that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, when you even look at other techniques such as uh, more active joint mobilization, neurodynamics, it's integrating that movement um, you know, which is technically an exercise, it's just at the lower end of, of loading. So, um, you know, integrating this movement can uh, can not only improve someone's function, but it can decrease their fear, um, improve their, their confidence with movement, decrease their pain, disassociate movement with pain, um, and really be that sort of kickstart into, into more active movement, return to uh, daily uh, living, um, activities and, and, and um, you know sport exercise whatever it may be so I think that's it's really important that integration from the, the passive what you do on the table to getting them up moving um, more comfortable with their movement and, and sort of de-threatening them so that's a nice little tool mm, that we can for sure can use. and the, just what we've been talking about for the last 10 minutes or so the science supports all that right yeah it supports it the evidence clinically supports that Anyone that works that way knows that it works better. But there will be plenty of us, and we have this conversation a lot in our courses, where that paradigm shift for someone who's been in this game for 15, you know, 20, maybe less years, and they've been treating in a very passive, one-directional kind of exchange type of, type of treatment, so now saying to their patients that have been managing for 10 years, let's get you up and moving. Let's see if we can incorporate some movement or some activity into your treatment. The patient might has been trained to receive your kind of treatment over those years, right? So changing that paradigm can be difficult. It can be, be confronting. And so, you know, it might not be for everybody. Some people are quite happy doing what they're doing, but if you if we can broaden our, our vision of, of the potential for things a little bit and go, well, let's just try it. Maybe we'll try it on a few patients. Mm. And I think you'll discover that starting to get that active involvement of patient through movement and their nervous system and their, you know, musculoskeletal system through movement just multiplies the effect and speeds it up so much more um, yeah and then we see this you know in the science we're talking about here the tissue loading a passive cup on the tissue or that could be a needle wound up it could be um, a taping technique it could be anything versus incorporating a bit of movement a little bit of higher load sustained load we start to see other mechanisms come into it that weren't at play with that more passive shorter application yeah, and it's just change input to the nervous system and we think about there are various different ways that we can do that, um, but if we change that input to the nervous system, you know, that can, that can be sort of a way to um, integrate more uh, active movement, um, 
but I guess one one barrier that people often come up against is my patient comes in for a massage how do I how do I get them active how do I get them up and moving um, you know so that's really where that that whole education um, part of it comes into it but uh, I think the more that you believe in it and the more that confidence you, that you are and you can demonstrate the benefits of, of getting a patient active um, that's that's the key um, mm. so yeah giving it a go and um, you know yeah, it's all well and good to apply a treatment on the table um, and get someone out of pain that's fantastic but you got to think about how would we progress it it it'd be no different to go into the gym lifting the same weight progressive you know week in week out um, you'll get some adaptations and some good changes initially but eventually those results will start to plateau um, so in, in an exercise setting it would be some form of progressive overload um, to allow that to adapt with a treatment it's no different we need to um, think about how we can progress each treatment uh, to improve our results over time. Absolutely, yeah. So I guess the key takeaways from this are gonna be that when we are running our thumb up somebody's hamstrings, we're not lengthening that muscle. We're not really, we're not deforming the tissue to a point that those fibers are now longer than they were before. When we apply a cross fiber tissue techniques across a bit of, you know, uh, old fibrotic scarring or something that, from a muscle tear, we might get a little bit of change in the state and the feel of that, but we're not gonna be pulling apart layers of tissue um, those things might be possible, but not with those techniques. Yeah, yeah. and we've got to consider that the nervous system, fascia, connective tissue, it's highly, highly innovated. Um, you know, the, the effects that we have often are a response of the nervous system. We change that input to the nervous system that triggers autonomic responses in vasodilation, modulation of pain at the spinal cord level, at mm. the... Um, in the brain there's changes, there's descending changes as far as um, hormonal responses, endocrine responses, so um, yeah, there's a lot There's a lot that goes on. Heaps, yeah, and look, I'm gonna talk about this in, in more depth on Wednesday night in our um, uh, Mechanisms Manual Therapy webinar, but there's kind of four things, right? So we have mechanical forces, mm -hmm. which are part of the puzzle. It's not the, that's not the start and the end, mechanical. We have chemical changes as a result of some of those mechanical forces. We have neurological changes which either trigger them the chemical change or are triggered by it, or maybe both. And then you've got the psychological component, which is all of the psychosocial factors. It's all of the, 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 the intangibles that are hard to measure, but are, have been proven to be a contributing factor. Yeah. And so there's four things there that we've got to look at um, with every application. It's not what we're doing that produces the outcome a lot of the time. It is, that's A. C is the outcome. There's B, C all the way through to Y in the middle. Yeah. There's a lot going on there. Eventually, you might have the change in the, the, the tissue tone. Um, but yeah, it's, it's gone in multiple places before that. that is the, the output. Yeah, cool. Interesting conversation. Yeah. This is just how Bo and I roll. We get in the car and go for a drive and nerd out <laughs> real hard. So thanks for entertaining us uh, or, or for uh, allowing us to entertain ourselves on camera. <laughs> Have a good day, guys. We'll talk to you soon. Cheers.